Hey everybody, thanks for coming along tonight, um, this afternoon, it's a beautiful day. I should probably be outside drinking beer by the river, but thanks for coming anyway. Um, I am just going to talk a little bit about a project that I worked on while I was here at the Future Lab as a resident artist. I came over uh, very briefly in the end of last year, but then came for about six weeks uh, at the beginning of this year. And I thought what I'd do is just very briefly give a bit of uh, history of sort of where this project really came from, and then uh, kind of take you through some of the developments sort of step by step. Um, so this project was really all about objects, real, actual, physical things, but I'm actually sort of best known as a video artist. Video from 2010. It's called Static Number 12 Seek Stillness and Movement. And as you can probably tell from uh, this sort of work, I'm very interested in time as as material. So really, I look at look at time as a as a physical, tangible thing, as a as a kind of malleable material, as a as a medium in itself. Um, yeah, ever since I was a kid, really, I've been pretty much fascinated by geometry. I mean, trigonometry was my favorite subject in high school. And I think this kind of leads very naturally uh, to an interest in space and measurement, and also, you know, the relationship between space and time. But I think this idea of really trying to look at, look at time physically, almost like a, you know, as a volume, really came um, from studying animation, which I did. So this is way back in 1994, it just does seem like a long time ago now. Um, to film my name when I was at uh, film school in Melbourne, and uh, it was very much it's all about stop motion at this point. Very much in the Jan Schweinmeier modes with really black and white Eastern European stop motion. But the thing about studying animation, especially you know, stop motion like this, it gives you a very intimate understanding of the mechanics, the underlying mechanics of the moving image. And you become very familiar physically, like actually you're moving these things, like even muscle memory. You become very physically familiar with time. You know, the real key strategies of trying to represent time visually is to sequence very small slices of it. This is uh, Marais' very famous train timetable from Paris to Lyon. And uh, yeah, if this was another talk, I would now go into uh, great detail about the link between cinema, trains, and time. Um, I'll just very briefly. This is kind of usually one of the mainstays of these talks. I've been banging on about trains for a long
um, where was I? Uh, slices, thin slices to visually represent sequential progression. So uh, this video I made in 2005, it was shot in London, and as you can see, it's, so I've taken a video frame, it's shot in a, in a sort of an open plaza area in London, which is actually quite hard to find, but it's people walking past, and what I've done is take a very thin slice out, and then stack the slices on top and slightly offset them in time. And you create these kind of temporal beings, these sort of almost meta beings. I kind of like the, uh, how the legs almost become kind of like little DNA helixes as well. It's almost like people's sort of genes made visible through their port cycles. And then just the last of these early works um, I'm going to show you is trying to sort of illustrate this idea of stacked time objects. Are these uh, photographic images from around, and this is actually from a show in 2008, but the, the images were made in 2007. It's the same approach, taking very thin slices out of a moving image, stacking them up to form these new objects, which I call imaginary objects. So, yeah, swapping out the vertical dimension of space from the video and swapping it in with, uh, with time. The thing was, the sort of more I worked with these, with these kind of images and these kind of forms, two things really sort of start to happen. The first is you you really do start to think about videos as a volumetric thing, as an object in themselves. You can think of all the frames in a video as photographs and then you stack them one on top of the other. You actually get a, a kind of cube, like a stack of video. A normal video is we sort of push chronologically through them and that's what we call a movie, but with this volume, there are other ways of doing that, and I was really interested in exploring those. And then the other thing is, is that I actually started to want to kind of see around them, to actually move around them and see them from other angles. I wanted to kind of know what was going on in the back, what was happening on the front, and uh, to really you know, experience them in three dimensions as opposed to uh, just on the screen or as a, as a, as a photographic print. And so, this was my project really. Instead of taking 1D slices out of a video frame and then sort of make these alternate two dimensional images, I wanted to take 2D slices out of the real world and then stack them up to form 3D objects and make sculptural objects. So, this is sort of the uh, kind of rough idea basically. You can take a slice out of the real world, get the little cross sections stack them on top of the other and make these sort of moving time objects. And I did quite a lot of research. This is, I mean, I sort of really started trying to do this about eight or nine years ago. And uh, I did a lot of research into various ways that I might be able to do it. Um, various kind of scanning technologies. I looked at LiDAR, which is used a lot in, in the architecture sphere, but it's very slow. It's very high res, but it's very slow. Also with the motion capture from the sort of animation post-production world. And but it didn't doesn't get the, the, the resolution that I was really looking for. I really wanted to get every fold and crease in the in the fabric, in the real sort of the topology. I mean that's what is so beautiful in these sorts of images is the actual it's the reality. It's brainwave. I've been playing with some laser levels for another project and one of the uh, one way of scanning 3D objects is to, is to fire a line laser at it, spin it, and then do the trigonometry to, 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 to work out the deformations that pull out an object. And I thought, hey, this could be really good. One advantage of it as well is that it meant it kind of stayed in the video sphere, so it didn't have to kind of move into a programmatic sphere, which I wasn't super comfortable with. And uh, yeah, I started sort of looking at this, and then actually realized there are some um, tools out there. There are, there are tools for perspective correction, mainly corner panning, so 
and they're used very often in the post-production world for sticking it, you know, replacing a sign or putting a billboard into a shop or removing something off the side of the bus sort of thing. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it kind of worked perfectly. And so, yeah, so it's about seven years later, I finally had a proof of concept. Okay, all I've got to do now is get a whole lot of line levels and some high-res cameras. The red camera had just sort of come out at this point, so I had sort of 4K at quite high frame rates. It's all looking very exciting. So yeah, I finally had my proof of concept, which was perfect timing as uh, an opportunity rose to do a residency here at the Future Lab. And so of course, I proposed this project, this, is, this was it. I finally was going to realize this, this cross-section camera that I needed. Of course, everything changes. And uh, I arrived at the Future Lab and pretty much gave a presentation to everyone in the lab a little bit like what I've just been showing you, really. This is kind of what, what I've been doing, this is what I want to do. And everyone I spoke to, pretty much straight away, I was like, oh, you've got to talk to Otto. <laughs> like, everybody, it turns out, I love that line, for a Ted line, it turns out, you've got to talk to Otto. It turns out that Otto had been developing a tracking system using laser trackers. You can actually see some of them in the corner here of deep space. There's things like six or eight of them in here. And he'd been developing uh, a system for using them to track people as they walked around deep space, so he could you know, use it as an interactive sort of tool. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a kind of perfect. It was pretty much exactly what I needed. So anyway, there goes my brilliant idea of the line levels and the, and the further trigonometry. And uh, in come the robot sensors. And of course, yeah, this is... <laughs> Is, this is one of the, the one of the laser trackers. We actually got some sponsorship from SEC, the awesomely named company. Um, these are really amazing devices. I mean, they can see 80 meters to a resolution of about sort of five mils. And they are. They're quite incredible. And they've got a great name. But uh, the problem was they really didn't quite give the resolution that I was after. Um, this is some of the sort of early first scans, and you can see they're really jagged. And there's a few kind of doubles and extras and stuff, and the rainbow patterns are hard to make sense of, but you can kind of see that they're very sharp, jaggedy things. And so, next stage was to try uh, the Kinect cameras. And I, I'd played with Kinect cameras a little bit before, and I don't know, I, I sort of was slightly prejudiced against them or something, and I really just didn't think it was going to work, but we had a, uh, a trial version, a prototype version of the, the Kinect 2 in the lab. It's, I mean, it's one of the bonuses of coming to the future lab is you get the, the cool stuff that not everyone can get. And so we were able to do a test with that, and uh, that was much more exciting. This was much more kind of like what I was, what I was hoping to get. So this, this, this was good. The only problem was we only had one of them, and they weren't going to release them. We weren't releasing them until like sort of August or something, so that was bad. But uh, what we could do is we um, set up three Connect 1s and one Connect 2, but the Connect 1s only really have a range of about a metre, so we had to make this tiny little one metre envelope. The other thing is that the Connect 1s are a complete nightmare to calibrate. I mean, they're notoriously hard to calibrate. Really, you kind of have to do this intense sort of intrinsic pro um, calibration process, and yeah, it was a nightmare. But anyway, so I was pretty much there. So you can see here in this, we've got four on each corner, so you can kind of get each side, and then the idea is that I could then stitch them back together. And so this was it. We had our sort of our uh, our system for acquiring the numbers. I was getting these huge spreadsheets of numbers, then it became the process of, okay, how do I actually make these into objects? And <laughs> these are some of the first tests. And at this point, I madly started trying to learn 3D software. I think I was learning nine different pieces of software at once. And I'm not a 3D person at all, but I was like, you know, Rhino, Max, Cinema 4D, all, you know, kind of all the standard packages, all the way through to even sort of open source stuff like uh, I love some of these really awesome shapes, but 
Sacking your sausage here, you're losing the detail. Starting to get some of the black here a little bit. So this is sort of starting to get there, but it's still just not really quite working. Um, yeah, I mean, one, one, the, the sort of leading contender for the for best package to actually be able to do this was a, this open source package called MeshLab, which is, is pretty amazing actually. But it has no undo button. <laughs> Man, you should try, try using software without an undo. It's really annoying. But uh, um, to this, I, I'd left the lab at this point, so I'm back in Melbourne now, and I started sort of frantically groping around trying to find any way I could do this, and pretty much sort of gave up on trying to do it myself. I just did not think I was going to be able to do it, and I thought, well, I'm just going to have to you know, bring in the professionals, going to have to pay somebody. And I approached some 3D scanning, a 3D scanning company in Melbourne who work mainly with uh, the automotive industry, so they do a lot of scanning engine blocks and car parts to make sure that the fabricated part matches up with the CAD data. And they pointed me to some software, which was actually free software, it was just, um, which was amazing, and it, it re really is incredibly good software. And I was like, oh, that's fantastic, and, but I'm really running out of time now, can, can, can you guys just do it for me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I don't have any money, but I'm willing to pay somebody because it's killing me. And uh, this, so this is you know the sort of first, the first bringing them in. It was very good at uh, what's called polygonizing the, the the point clouds. But you can see here how wildly sort of misaligned and overlapping. And, and as the guys from this company said to me, it's like there is no way I would not wish this on my worst enemy. <laughs> Bonus. So I then launched into about three weeks of cleaning and aligning and connecting and repairing. You can sort of see, so basically what you have to do is go through and you know, strip out all the overlaps and then you kind of go through and sort of start to bridge them all together. And it was, I mean seriously this was an insane amount of work. I was dreaming triangles for about three weeks. <laughs> but then finally, after this period of triangle dreaming, I finally had some watertight meshes, and this is sort of where I've been you know, trying to get to. And with meshes, I could actually start to be looking at um, modeling them, and then once I started modeling them, then I could start thinking about actually getting them made in the real world. So, I mean, natural fabrication is a whole other story, which I will not bore you with, but um, basically I actually had a couple, couple made uh, cut out of foam, CNC milled out of foam, and they get sprayed with this uh, polyurethane spray, which is extremely inaccurate and horrible but it makes them hard. I also had some uh, 3D printed, just FDM printing. You can see here this uh, had to be sort of assembled in parts and glued together, and this is, this is then something being glued together. The thing I would point out in all of this is just there's, you know, this sort of dream of just hitting print is a long, long way away. The amount of manual labor that had to turn these from sort of these rough things that had come off a machine into, into sculptural objects was ginormous. I mean, this is my assistant Fiona, she spent a month and a half sanding these things. It was <laughs> crazy. Um, about three weeks backwards and forwards with the painters, trying to get the finish right. This is in the, in the spray booth. I love this one. And then finally, we're actually had them in a gallery, and putting them on the wall, and then, hallelujah, I finally saw one on the wall, finished on the wall, like some kind of being from another dimension just sort of sliding into the gallery and then sliding out again. And this was a really good moment, I have to say. This was a really great, great moment. And this is about nine years in the making, so this was, this was a happy times for me. Um, a couple of other photos. Um, this is the wide shot. 
It's actually a, a fourth one just behind us, but you can't really see that. So yeah, this 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 was a good moment for me. But then there was the Ars Electronica Festival, two weeks later. <laughs> and I decided it would be a great idea to try and cut out 826 pieces of plywood and try to stick them together in two and a half days. And that wasn't a good idea, but miraculously, after some very dodgy moments, we, uh, we finally made it. And so this is upstairs now. You can go up and, and check it out in the flesh. You can actually walk around it, which is the whole idea, you know, actual embodied experience. Um, yeah, this was another really great moment when, uh, when we finally saw this come up. I also made a couple of smaller objects, again 3D printed, and these are over in the gymnasium. They're kind of, yeah, they're kind of hidden. I actually really quite like these, uh, this install. They're very sort of pedestrian, just sort of just on the wall in situ. Um, kind of almost like Easter eggs or something, you've got to hump them out and find them. Just try and ignore those cables. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it. I don't want to get too long. Oh, no, it's a pretty, pretty good time. Um, but I just would like to say a couple of thanks just before I wrap up, um, because it was, it was a huge effort. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to Otto from the Future Lab, who was uh, my programming maestro and really made the scanner happen. And without him, there's no way it would have ever happened. So just super thanks to Otto. I'd also like to thank Claudia, who uh, basically made this thing happen. It was, I think she called 8,000 different woodcutters in the space of a week until we finally found someone who could do it at the time. And yeah, we were, it was originally it was planned to, to do something else, but the timelines just got squeezed insanely, and uh, yeah, this would not have happened without Claudia's assistance. Um, I'd also like to thank the Future Lab and everybody there, Horst and Christopher and Roland and Matt and Aga, everybody else in the Future Lab who answered all my questions and sort of mad last second sort of panic, can you fix this or can you help with this or how do we do this? Really, it, it, it was the perfect place to come and try and do a residency like this. And then, lastly, I had got to do a, a, a big shout out to the Australia Council, who actually funded both the residency and also my coming back for the festival to be able to present some of the outcomes and to be able to talk to you here tonight as well. So, a huge thanks to the Australia Council. And, uh, yeah, thank you for coming tonight. Cheers.